Some are famous, renowned for having supernatural power. Others are unnamed, yet are told of in legend. They all come into play in memorable and emotional ways in the wide history of Tolkien's world. Today on Nerd of the Rings, we cover the greatest horns of Middle-earth. While many fans will no doubt recall famous horns in the days of the Lord of the Rings, iconic horns were part of the very earliest writings. The Ulumuri were the great horns of the Vala Ulmo, the Lord of Waters. The Ulumuri, described as great white conches which produced the sound of the sea, were created by Salmar, a Maya in the service of Ulmo. Tolkien first wrote of the Ulumuri back in 1914 in a poem called The Horns of Ylmir. This poem, which appears in the History of Middle-earth volume The Shaping of Middle-earth, is a song sung by Tuor to his son Earendil, telling of when Tuor met the mighty Valar. In Unfinished Tales, we are told about this meeting, and thereupon Ulmo lifted up a mighty horn and blew upon it a single great note, to which the roaring of the storm was but a windflaw upon a lake. And as he heard that note, and was encompassed by it, and filled with it, it seemed to Tuor that the coasts of Middle-earth vanished, and he surveyed all the waters of the world in a great vision, from the veins of the lands to the mouths of the rivers, and from the strands and estuaries out into the deep. The great sea he saw through its unquiet regions, teeming with strange forms, even to its lightless depths, in which, amid the everlasting darkness, there echoed voices terrible to mortal ears. Its measureless plains he surveyed with the swift sight of the Valar. The Ulumuri not only give Tuor this vision, but also awaken a sea longing in his heart, and his son, Earendil, would go on to become the great mariner. But Ulmo would not be the only Valar with a famous horn. There is also Orome, the huntsman of the Valar, said to be more dreadful than Tolkas in his anger. Orome, whose very name means sound of horns, has a great horn known as the Valaroma. The Valaroma is the name of his great horn, the sound of which is like the upgoing of the sun in scarlet, or the sheer lightning cleaving the clouds. In the earliest days of the world, Orome used this horn in the training of his folk and his beasts for the pursuit of the evil creatures of Melkor. In the Silmarillion, we are told of the effect Orome's horn has on the servants of evil. In the twilight of the world, Orome would sound the Valaroma, his great horn, upon the plains of Arda, whereat the mountains echoed and the shadows of evil fled away and Melkor himself quailed in Utumno, foreboding the wrath to come. And in the early days of the elves, we are told that the Sindar of Beleriand, when they would hear the great Valaroma, would know that all evil things were fled far away. Yet the mighty horn of Orome would not disperse all evil, for in the aftermath of the destruction of the two trees, Orome attempts to use the Valaroma to disperse the unlight of Ungoliant, only to find the sound faltered and the riders were scattered in the darkness. There are other horns with considerably less history around them, indeed some with just a passing reference in earlier drafts of the Lord of the Rings. One such horn is Windbeam, said to be the horn of Elendil. In this draft, found in the book The Treason of Isengard, Frodo hears the faint sound of a horn while scaling Mount Doom. It is said to be Windbeam, Horn of Elendil, blown only in extremity. Christopher Tolkien's footnote on this horn states that if it were to appear elsewhere in his father's writings, he did not find it. Interestingly though, he notes that it appears in the last letter of Father Christmas. In this instance, it is known as the Great Horn, which Father Christmas has not had to blow in 400 years. Here, its sound is said to carry as far as the north wind blows. In far more recent Middle-earth history, we find another unnamed yet impactful horn, the Horn of Helm Hammerhand. This particular horn was immortalized in the Two Towers film as part of the massive structure of the Hornburg, 
sounding as our heroes made their last desperate charge against the army of Urukai. The story of the actual horn is much smaller, yet even more chilling. Helm's horn, which has no particular name in the text, would become one of the most haunting sounds in all Middle-earth. When, in 2759 of the Third Age, Helm is stuck within the Suthburg, under siege by the invading Dunlendings, the king grows fierce and gaunt by grief at the loss of his sons and famine among his people. In his ferocity, Helm would go out at night, clad all in white, and stalk into enemy camps, killing his enemies with his bare hands. Helm had a great horn, and soon it was marked that before he sallied forth, he would blow a blast upon it that echoed in the deep. And then so great a fear fell on his enemies that instead of gathering to take him or kill him, they fled away down the coombe. One night, Helm would not return, but would be found frozen where he stood. Still, the tale of Helm Hammerhand would be told in Dunland for many years to come. And men said that the horn was still heard at times in the deep, and the wraith of Helm would walk among the foes of Rohan and kill men with fear. While the memory of Helm's horn would last for many long years, there would be a horn much older and more powerful originating in the south. Indeed, this horn would be known as the Great Horn, and it was made by Varondil the Hunter, steward of Gondor under King Earnil II. Varondil would hunt in the far-off lands of Rhun. Near the Sea of Rhun, he would hunt the Kine of Ara, a species of oxen more hardy and wild than any other in Middle-earth. Legend tells that they were descended from the cattle of Orome himself. It was from the horn of one of these oxen that Varondil fashions the Great Horn. The horn was white, bound with silver, and inscribed with ancient characters. It would be passed down from Varondil, who lived around 2000 of the Third Age, through the line of the stewards, all the way to Boromir. And it was said that if it be blown at need anywhere within the bounds of Gondor, as the realm was of old, its voice will not pass unheeded. Boromir would indeed carry it with him on his great journey to Rivendell. As they make to leave on their quest, Boromir would, perhaps ill-advised, blow the horn before departing. Loud and clear it sounds in the valleys of the hills, he said, and then let all the foes of Gondor flee. Putting it to his lips, he blew a blast, and the echoes leapt from rock to rock, and all that heard that voice in Rivendell sprang to their feet. Slow should you be to win that horn again, Boromir, said Elrond, until you stand once more on the borders of your own land, and dire need is on you. Maybe, said Boromir, but always I have let my horn cry at setting forth, and though thereafter we may walk in the shadows, I will not go forth as a thief in the night. The horn would next be blown after the Fellowship is discovered in Moria, and comes face to face not only with a horde of orcs, but the dreaded Balrog. The dark figure streaming with fire raced towards them. The orcs yelled and poured over the stone gangways. Then Boromir raised his horn and blew. Loud the challenge rang and bellowed, like the shout of many throats under the cavernous roof. For a moment the orcs quailed, and the fiery shadow halted. Then the echoes died, as suddenly as a flame blown out by a dark wind, and the enemy advanced again. Mighty as the horn was, and despite giving the Balrog a brief pause, it was no match for the power and darkness of the Servant of Morgoth. The Great Horn would be blown for the last time on February 26, 3019. As the Fellowship is under attack by the Urukai, Suddenly, with a deep-throated call, a great horn blew, and the blasts of it smote the hills and echoed in the hollows, rising in a mighty shout above the roaring of the falls. While help would come, it would come too late. Despite initially being driven back, the Uruks would return with great force. Boromir is slain, and his horn is cloven in two. The pieces of the horn are laid in the boat bearing Boromir's body, and sent over the falls of Rauros in the river Anduin. While Boromir's body would ultimately be taken out to the Great Sea, the two pieces of horn would wash ashore downriver. One piece is discovered in the reeds near the mouths of the Entwash 
on February 28th, and the other further downriver on February 30th. They would then be taken to Denethor, who would hold them upon his lap as he waited for tidings of his eldest son. As Faramir would later tell Frodo, he and Denethor heard Boromir's horn call all the way from Minas Tirith. I heard the blowing of that horn, from the northward it seemed, but dim, as if it were but an echo in the mind, a boding of ill we thought it, my father and I, for no tidings had we heard of Boromir since he went away, and no watcher on our borders had seen him pass. There was yet another famous horn of Middle-earth that may have predated the Great Horn and would survive much longer. Sometime prior to 2000 of the Third Age, dwarves of the Grey Mountains had made a silver horn which, among other treasures, would be stolen by the dragon Skatha. This dragon would in turn be killed by Fram, Lord of the Eothade of the North. While Fram and the dwarves would feud over rights to the treasure, the horn would remain with his people. Eventually, it would become an heirloom of the House of Eorl, the kings of Rohan. This particular horn would not be mentioned for over a thousand years. After the fall of Sauron, Eowyn and Eomer would give this very horn to Mariadoc Brandybuck before he departs. Mary would use this horn to rally the hobbits of the Shire to revolt against Saruman's ruffians. We are told that as Sam is riding toward the cotton farm to call more people to arms, he hears Mary's horn, and so compelling was that call that Sam almost turned and dashed back. Indeed, Mary would blow the horn of the mark many times during the course of retaking the Shire. From that day onward, every November 2nd, the horn of the mark was sounded, commemorating the liberation of the Shire and marking the beginning of feasts celebrating the important date in Shire history. While these are the most famous and well-known horns, they are far from the only ones featured in Tolkien's works. We see throughout the text moments marked with a horn call, perhaps none greater than in the midst of the Siege of Gondor. The Great Gate is broken asunder, and the Witch King has strode into the archway, with a lone figure standing in his way, Gandalf upon Shadowfax. As these powerful figures seem set to test their powers against one another, help beyond hope is heard before it is seen. And as if in answer there came from far away another note, horns, horns, horns. In dark Mindoluan sides they dimly echoed, great horns of the north wildly blowing. Rohan had come at last. As always, I want to say a huge thank you to all my Patreon and YouTube supporters who make this channel possible. Tom DeBombadil19, Listen Me the Cinda, Rabbi Rob Thomas, Charles Leisure, CCDC Red Team, Joe Tepper, The Mighty Mim, Andrew Carlisle, Swirl Traveler, Matthew Jeffrey, Viking Lord, Leo Vittori, Sky Carcass, Slide Belts, Dane Ragnarsson, Berto Berg, Graham Derricott, The Dark Haired One, Wyland, Micah Wu, and Debbie. If you enjoyed the artwork in this video, check out the artists in the description to purchase prints of their great work for yourself. Thanks so much for watching, and we'll see you next time on Nerd of the Rings.